Hi everyone, I'm Ellen Cummings. Welcome to Block 4. I'm going to be team teaching the MedSurge portion of this class along with Tiffany New Knudsen. My very favorite topic is cardiac and I hope you're as excited to learn more about what a fascinating organ the heart really is as I am to present it to you. This narration will take you through the first part of the EKG packet. We'll be going through the sinus rhythms and a little more and then we'll complete the packet when you're at Gateway for your preclinical lab day. If you printed the EKG packet and you're looking at that, and, and you should, it'll make it easier, you see objectives for the entire packet. We're only going to go through the first part of the packet as preclinical lab assignment, so we'll be picking up the rest of the packet in preclinical lab. Here are the objectives for this preclinical lab section of the packet. We're going to review basic cardiac physiology, including heart chambers, blood flow, and the conduction system through the heart, describe the normal sequence of electrical conduction in the heart, identify a normal P wave, QRS complex, and a T wave on an EKG strip, and analyze EKG strips and identify the following rhythms, sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, and atrial fibrillation. We focus on the electrical conduction system of the heart when we review EKG, but electrical conduction is only a part of actually moving blood flow forward. We need electrical stimuli, and that's what we see graphically on an EKG, but we also need a working muscle and parts. So let's do a little review of the parts. Remember that atria are reservoirs for ventricles. You remember that the heart has right and left chambers. The right atria collects blood that will move into the right ventricle during diastole, and the left atria is collecting blood to move into the left ventricle. Atrial chambers are considered low pressure, and they really just serve as reservoirs for their respective pumps. Now, ventricles are the pumps. Right ventricular contraction pushes blood into the pulmonary vasculature, and left ventricular contraction pushes blood into the aorta to perfuse the body. The heart is really a relatively small muscle, and it can't do all that work by itself. Blood also moves, really primarily moves through the body because of pressure gradients. Blood flows from high pressure, and that starts with the left ventricle and throughout the arterial system, to low pressure, and that's the venous system in the right side of the heart. So the right ventricle is a very low pressure chamber. It doesn't have to work very hard. It's a very thin little tube, and that's because pressure in the pulmonary vasculature is very low. Typical mean pressure in the pulmonary artery is somewhere between maybe 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury, so pretty low. Now, the right ventricle, as I said, is a thin little tube of muscle. The left ventricle is a high-pressure chamber, and so that requires a big bulky, bulky muscle, and that's the largest portion of the heart muscle. The left ventricle has to push, push oxygenated blood through the aortic valve into the arterial system. Um, that's much higher pressure. The left ventricle has to generate enough pressure to open the aortic valve and push into that arterial system. And remember, mean arterial pressure is much higher than what we talked about with pulmonary pressures. Mean arterial is anywhere from 65 to 105 millimeters of mercury normally. Valves keep blood moving in a forward direction. The atrioventricular or AV valves are the tricuspid and mitral valves. When you're listening to heart sounds, um, that lub dub or S1, S2, um, that, that S1 lub sound is produced by closure of the tricuspid and mitral valves. The semilunar valves, and that's the pulmonic valve on the right side and aortic on the left, closure of the semilunars create the S2 or the dub sound um, you know, when you're listening to the heart. Remember also that the heart muscle itself needs oxygen. The coronary arteries supply oxygen to both mechanical and electrical structures in the heart. What do I mean by that? The mechanical structure is the heart muscle, the myocardium. Electrical structure is the specialized cells within the myocardium that help us to conduct electricity. We have to remember that if there's a problem with the coronary arteries, for example, the patient has a heart attack, not only is the myocardium, the muscle itself, at risk, and that affects pumping, but electrical structures are also at risk, and that's going to infect, affect conduction, and we wind up getting dysrhythmia. We also know we don't get myocardial contraction without that ability to conduct electricity to the myocardium and create the stimuli. 
One more thing to remember is that somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of coronary artery filling happens during ventricular diastole. Um, ventricles are relaxed and filling and so we have low pressure. Um, that's important when we see patients that have tachycardic rates. Um, we don't have as much time to fill the ventricles and so that can cause cardiac output to drop and also create problems with the muscle itself. We established that blood moves forward and moves in a forward direction. It's helpful to remember the path blood flow takes. If you are monitoring a little red blood cell traveling from the lower extremity up through the inferior vena cava, it would first hit the heart at the right atria. From there, the blood cell is going to pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, then through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. Um, remember that this is the only spot in the body where an artery carries deoxygenated blood. From the pulmonary artery, the cell is going to travel to the capillary network around alveoli for gas exchange. Next, the oxygenated red cell is going to enter a pulmonary vein and then the left atria. From the left atria, the cell is going to pass through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then through the aortic valve um, to the aorta in the body. Now remember this when we talk about things like heart failure or valvular dysfunction. For example, if your patient has left ventricular heart failure, the left ventricle is not pumping very well. Less blood moves forward and that means more and more accumulates and backs up. Kind of like what happens when your toilet clogs. You flush and instead of disappearing down the drain, well, stuff winds up going backward. And if this is your bathroom, it's all over the floor and that's disgusting. When it's your left ventricle, the extra fluid accumulates in the left atria. Then in the pulmonary vasculature, um, those vessels wind up getting engorged and because of the high pressure, fluid is going to leak into the interstitial tissue around alveoli. Once again, we're going to increase pressure and that's going to create a pressure gradient that's going to move fluid into, into alveoli. Your patient then has crackles, they're hypoxic, they're not feeling so great. So the heart is a pump, but it can't work without electricity. Electrical stimulus um, causing cardiac muscles to contract is what the conduction system of the heart is all about. When you look at this picture, um, you see these lines, and, and it makes it appear that there are cells that look like wires running through the heart, and, and that's not the case. That's not what you're going to see if you're actually looking at a heart muscle. When we talk about the conduction system, we're referring to specialized cells that carry an electrical signal and cause what's called a wave of depolarization that stimulates myocardial cells to contract. Normally, the electrical stimulus starts up here at the sinoatrial node. It's called the sinoatrial node, the sinus node, or the SA node. Now, the SA node is the heart's dominant pacemaker, and its pacing activity is known as sinus rhythm. The cells of the sinus node have pro a property called automaticity. And as I mentioned, our SA node is up here in the upper posterior wall of the right atria. The SA node initiates an electrical impulse at regular intervals, generally at a rate of 60 to 90 beats a minute. The electrical impulse spreads through the atrial myocardium in a large circular wave, causing depolarization. Basically, it's a wave of sodium that moves into cells and um, changes the electrical um, gradient of the cell, and that stimulates contraction. When we look at an EKG, we see this as a waveform called the P wave on the EKG. Now, the, when you look at valves, and this doesn't illustrate it very well, all of the valves um, sit on fibrous tissue, and that fibrous tissue actually divides the atria from the ventricles. So impulses from the SA node aren't going to jump directly to the ventricle. Um, when that happens, it's called an accessory pathway, and it's never a good thing. So the atrial ventricular node, or also called the AV node, um, everything is going to kind of collect here, so to speak, or it'll take that impulse and it's going to distribute depolarization to the ventricles. Now, the AV node is pretty special. It's protective of the ventricles, for one thing. Um, well, how does it do that? In two ways. One, the AV node hangs on to the impulse um, for just a fraction of a second. And what that does is it allows a little more time for the atria to finish contracting. 
The other thing that the AV node will do is it will protect the ventricles from excessively high atrial rates. An example of this that we'll be talking about later is atrial fibrillation. In a fib, there's a bunch of chaotic electrical impulses that are just firing away willy-nilly and, and very fast. The atria just quiver because of that. Now, we can live with a quivering atria. We still get volume in the ventricles because of pressure gradients, but we can't live with a quivering ventricle. That's V-fib, and that's dead. So the AV node doesn't send all those impulses to the ventricle. What it does send through, though, goes through in an irregular pattern. Um, more on AFib later. From the AV node down this bundle of hiss, and then the conduction system bifurcates into the right and the left bundle branches. Now the bundles and bundle branch refers to bundles of rapidly uh, conducting Purkinje fibers. Now you see Purkinje fibers are labeled here, but it's actually bunches of Purkinje fibers here um, that are bundled up. Now the, the impulse spreading through the ventricle very, is very rapid. It causes a rapid wave of depolarization. Remember that's a wave of sodium that rushes into cell and contraction should follow. Now you notice I said should. Just because there's electric, electrical conduction, there is no guarantee that we're going to get contraction. I mentioned automaticity when we talked about the SA node. That means it's capable of initiating an electrical impulse and it's normally the pacemaker of the heart. But what happens if the SA node fails? That can happen and fortunately our heart's pretty smart and it has some built-in fail-safes. If something happens and the SA node fails, that a portion of the AV node called AV junctional tissue can take over as an automaticity foci. Now it's not as fast as the SA node. Typically the AV nodal junctional tissue paces at a rate of about 40 to 60 a minute. And that's why we have uh, when what you, you know, you, we won't talk about in this class, but um, that will create what's called a junctional rhythm. Now, what happens if you're unfortunate enough that both your SA and AV nodes fail? And that can happen with certain types of right ventricular heart attacks. Um, fortunately for us, we do have another fail safe. That's the Purkinje fibers. They are the last fail safe. And they'll take over to pace the heart if there's no signal coming from the, you know, from above, so to speak. Um, but the rate is somewhat slow at about 20 to 40 beats a minute. Now, all of these areas of automaticity are influenced by the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system. If parasympathetic stimulation dominates, heart rate is slower than normal. And if sympathetic stimulation dominates, the heart rate will be faster. Excitability refers to how well the myocardial cell responds to stimuli or to outside stimuli. It's good for the myocardium to respond to electrical signals meant to pace the heart, but not so good if cells are irritable and responsive to other foci. That's when we tend to get dysrhythmia. It's one of the reasons we get dysrhythmia. Conductivity is the ability of the cardiac cells to receive the electrical stimuli and pass them along, conduct the impulse onto the next cell. That's a good property. And contract, contractility refers to the response of the myocardium, and that's the shortening of the muscle cells that causes contraction that actually moves volume forward. Remember, once again, contraction is not going to occur uh, without an electrical stimuli, but we can have electrical stimuli and no response, no contraction. These terms actually should sound familiar to you. You've been learning about and administering cardiac medications to patients. I know way back in block one, you guys learned about things like digoxin. Some meds work by, by altering, altering these properties. So for example, you know that when you give digoxin, that dig is considered a positive inotrope. It can increase the strength of contraction. Dobutamine is another positive inotrope. DIG is also a negative chronotrope, so it'll slow conduction through the AV node. It slows the heart rate. Beta blockers are negative inotropes. They decrease the force of contraction. Antidysrhythmics affect automaticity and excitability, and sometimes contractility and heart rate. Sorry, the squeaky here in the background is one of my doggies. Um, so what is an EKG or ECG, and that's electrocardiogram? It's actually a graphic recording of electrical activity that the heart is generating. A guy named Eindhoven figured out how to record this way back in 1901 or 1902, a long time ago. 
EKG is a very helpful assessment tool. Um, as you can see, it can help diagnose things like conduction abnormalities, dysrhythmia, cardiac hypertrophy or enlargement of the heart muscle, um, pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardial sac, electrolyte imbalances, and very importantly, a heart attack. As great a tool as EKGs are, though, they always, always have to be interpreted in conjunction with clinical findings. It's really important to remember that we always treat the patient, not the EKG. Also very important to remember, electrical activity precedes mechanical activity. The muscle has to have that electrical stimulus to contract. And as we know, electrical activity can occur without being followed by mechanical activity. That means your patient could have a picture-perfect sinus rhythm on the monitor, but be unresponsive, no pulse, dead. Now that's what we term PEA, pulseless electrical activity. We have a rhythm on the monitor that should perfuse the patient, but the patient is clinically dead. So don't just look at the EKG and assume your patient is alive. When we're looking at an EKG tracing, you see that it's printed on paper that has lots and lots of little squares. EKG printouts can be strips that spit out from a defibrillator or an eight by eight and a half by 11 inch paper with multiple leads. Whatever way it's printed, the information there is still the same. The vertical axis, which is the up and down here, that actually measures voltage. The horizontal axis, which is across the strip here, that's a measurement of time. For our purposes, we're gonna focus on time. Now, you notice that we have these teeny tiny little boxes. These are little one millimeter boxes, and I call them baby boxes. And I don't know what the technical term is, but they're baby boxes to me. So they are hard to see. Um, you'll notice that a bundle of baby boxes, and it's five by five, is kind of highlighted. And then if you look here, we took that highlighted bundle and put it over here to make it a little bit easier to see. Now what it's showing is we've got that one millimeter baby box. Now technically speaking, if we were looking at voltage, which is the vertical axis, each one millimeter box represents 0.1 millivolts. When we look at the horizontal axis, each one millimeter box represents 0.04 seconds of time along that horizontal axis, this teeny tiny little chunk of time, it's not even a second. Those, you know, like I said, those are pretty tiny little boxes and it's hard to see. So we like the fact that they outlined it a little bit. All right, so once again, each baby box is a one millimeter box and on the horizontal axis, it represents time from here to here is 0.04 seconds. When we look then, if you add five, 0 0.04 times five, that bigger box is worth 0 0.2 seconds. So let's count this out. Um, from here to here is 0 0.04, 0 0.08, 0 0.12, 0 0.16, 0 0.2, okay? Let's take it a little bit further here. This is a six second strip. We're gonna start at the bottom left-hand corner. Remember again that each baby box is worth 0.04 seconds. Each larger box across the horizontal area or horizontal axis is worth 0.2 seconds. If we have five of these large boxes across, we have one second. How did I get that? Well, let's start here from zero here to here is 0 0.2. We add a 0 0.2 to get 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one second. So five large boxes horizontally is one second of time. Now, um, when we're looking, we're in, in just a second, I'm gonna show you how to calculate a rate looking at a six second strip. Why would I do that? I mean, you've, you've seen monitors that have EKG displays or looked at printed EKG strips and you know the heart rate is typically displayed on the monitor or printed. The problem is the monitor sometimes isn't that smart about picking up on artifact and it can give you an artificial or an incorrect rate. For that reason, it's always a good idea to know how to estimate a heart rate. And because I'm trying to reinforce the concept of time um, across this horizontal axis on the strip, I'm going to make you calculate some heart rates. The easiest way to do that, the easiest estimate that works, whether the rhythm is regular or irregular, is what's called the six-second strip method. 
Now, in order to make that a little easier for you to see, a lot of um, strips as they print will have little grids or hash marks that will mark out three seconds. And they can either be found at the top of the strip or sometimes at the bottom of the strip. So this slash here to this slash here is three seconds. So let's count it out again. Remember, baby box, 0 0.04 seconds. So 0 0.04, 0 0.08. 0 0.12, 0 0.16, 0 0.2. So from 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one second. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0.8, two seconds. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, three seconds. But we want Three seconds isn't really enough strip to get an accurate, um, somewhat accurate measurement. So we want six seconds worth of strip. And so we're actually going to put two of these three seconds together to do six seconds. Let's look at a strip that has a waveform so we can actually try that out. We want to estimate the heart rate. So first off, we're going to look at the strip and figure out six seconds. This strip is a little different than the previous one. You notice that you do have the longer hash marks here, and from here to here then is three seconds, another three seconds. So if I want six seconds, I'm gonna go all the way over to here. This one also marks out your one second. Um, so here to here is one second, um, two seconds, three seconds. So what am I gonna do? I wanna count waveforms to within six seconds. And when I look at waveforms, I can either count what are called P waves. And P waves are gonna be a first little bump here, and I'll explain what does that um, in just a second. So I can either count these little P waves or I'll count the QRS complexes. And these are bigger, they're a heck of a lot easier to see. And so I use the QRS. Um, you know, I, I like that I can see it better. Besides that, a patient can have a, an EKG without a discernible P wave and be okay. But if the patient doesn't have a discernible QRS, well, they're dead, and counting heart rate is really not the priority at this moment in time. Anyways, um, let's get back to it, and we're going to count. Let's count the EKG complexes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine completed complexes within six seconds worth of strip. Well, I want to know what the heart rate is per minute, and so what I'm going to do is multiply nine by 10, 10 seconds, um, to get 60 seconds. So 9 by 10 is going to give me an estimated heart rate of 90 beats a minute. Now your textbook mentions a method whereby you count baby boxes between QRSs. Um, some of you probably have good enough eyes to do that. I don't, um, but you know, if you want to do that, you're welcome to do that. So you count baby boxes from one QRS to the next. Then you divide the number of baby boxes into 1,500. Yikes, um, that's a, not only too many baby boxes, but a little too much math for me. The, only pro the other problem with it is if the rhythm is irregular, you can't use that method because um, you know it'll vary depending on QRS to QRS. Let's look at a bit more terminology. We talked about depolarization. Remember that depolarization is essentially a wave of positively charged ions that rush into myocardial cells, changing the electrical gradient from negative to positive and stimulating contraction. As sodium moves into the cell, potassium shifts out. Certain AV nodal cells um, need calcium to help with depolarization. Repolarization is a return to a normal resting state for the myocardial cell, and that means ions have to put, be put back to where they belong. Sodium has to be actively pumped out of the cell and potassium pumped back in. Repolarization requires energy to fuel the little ATP pumps that are in the cell and actually perform this, and that requires oxygen and glucose. That gets problematic when the patients, for example, have a heart attack. Um, and that's part of the reason we see EKG changes with, with MI or heart attack. Now, when we look at the term baseline, baseline refers to a state of readiness. Um, it's the starting or resting line of the EKG. Um, we refer to it as isoelectric, that's another term for it, because baseline is the point where no measurable depolarization or repolarization is occurring. The term wave means any deflection from that baseline. 
That wave can be upright, um, and that's termed a positive deflection. And it occurs when a wave of depolarization is moving toward a positive electrode. Negative deflections occur when the waveform points downward. Sometimes you'll see waveforms that have both positive and negative components, and that's termed biphasic. Here's our EKG complex. It starts with the P wave, and that's the first bump here, and you'll see it's color-coded so it is green. The P wave represents atrial depolarization, and that means somewhere around here, the SA node fired, remember it sends out a wave of sodium that causes depolarization. Sodium is going to shift into the myocardium and atrial contraction should follow. Now the P wave should be upright and rounded like this one. It shouldn't be upside down, it shouldn't be flat, it, it, it shouldn't be biphasic, um, it should look this way. Okay. Um, you'll see also right here we have this little thing termed PR, and that's referring to PR interval, and it's only a part of the PR interval. What this is, though, is an example of that isoelectric state. During this tiny little time frame, there isn't anything going on um, that's measurable, no electricity that's measurable, and so everything is back to baseline. If I were to trace, see, here's my baseline, nothing's going on electrically, and then I've got electrical depolarization. I'm back to baseline, and we're, we're all lined up on the same axis. Um, I've got another waveform, I'm back to baseline, okay? Another waveform, and I'm back to baseline. And that's what you're looking at when you're looking to see whether things are isoelectric or not. This little bit also, remember I had said that um, the AV node kind of hangs on to depolarization for a short period of time that allows the atria to more fully contract. We're going to measure certain things along this horizontal axis to help us figure out how well the conduction system is working. We'll do that on the next slide. The big red complex is what's called the QRS, and this represents ventricular depolarization. It's big because there's so much muscle mass in the ventricles. Now, particularly the left ventricle, there are actually three separate waveforms here. This first waveform, this downward waveform, is your Q wave. The upward, the first upward waveform, is the R wave. And then the downward waveform that follows that is called the S wave. So I actually do have a Q, an R, and an S. Sometimes we'll look at something that we label QRS and you don't see this little dippity doo -dah. And technically speaking, it's only an RS wave. For our purposes, we're just going to look at these things and we're going to say, hey, it's a QRS. After the QRS, you see something that's labeled ST segment. This is also an isoelectric time in the cardiac cycle, and it should be at baseline. More on that in a second. Then the last waveform is the T wave. And that represents ventricular repolarization. Remember, this is where sodium, potassium, and in some instances, calcium ions are moved back to where they belong. And this requires energy. One of the indicators of a heart attack, and I mentioned this a little bit before, is ST elevation and or T wave changes. So this is a repolarization of the ventricle that's going on in here. And the reason we'll see those changes is because with a heart attack, there's less energy available, um, less oxygen and glucose. So the body has a hard time stowing ions back to where they belong. And those become changes we see on the EKG. Now, specific information about this, more specific. Remember, we're going to talk about the measurements. Now, remember that the P wave, and that was here, represents um, atrial depolarization. You see that the P wave here is upright, and that's normal. Um, if you observe that the P wave is inverted or biphasic, and remember biphasic means both positive and negative um, components, well, that's not normal. An inverted or upside down P wave um, could mean that there's a junctional rhythm. The, a, the SA node isn't working. The um, junctional tissue at the AV node had to kick in. Um, so if we see an upside down P wave, particularly if it's really close to the QRS, that's going to be a junctional rhythm. Now, um, remember that junctional tissue is our first fail safe. We're going to make some measurements that tell us how long it takes for the electrical energy to move through parts of the conduction system. As I said before, that gives us a clue to certain problems. The first measurement we usually make after we figure the heart rate is the PR interval. That measurement is made from the beginning of the, the P wave, and this is showing you PR interval. So we start at the beginning of the P wave. 
And the P wave begins when you follow baseline and you see the wave lift off of baseline. And depending on what's going on, it can go up or down, remember. So that change from baseline is where you start the PR interval. So PR interval starts here. And we measure the PR interval to the next waveform, which is the QRS. As soon as we see the first um, inflection or deflection of QRS, that's the end of our PR interval. Okay, so here to here. Now, a normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. So when we think about it in terms of baby boxes, 0.12 is three baby boxes, 0.16 is four baby boxes, and 0.2 is five baby boxes. What happens if we measure the PR interval and it's not within that range? Well, if the PR is shorter than expected, and that's less than 0.12 seconds, then it's likely, it's most likely that the patient is in a junctional rhythm. And um, as I mentioned before, it's typical that the P wave is inverted with that junctional rhythm. If the PR interval is longer than 0.2 seconds, it may be due to one of the heart blocks. And um, it's typically, in, in this case, it's gonna be what's called a first degree heart block or first degree AV block. Now we're gonna talk about heart blocks later in class and in our ACLS class. The next thing we're gonna look at is our QRS complex. Now remember, this represents ventricular depolarization and we're gonna measure this to see how long it takes the waveform or the energy to move through the ventricle. Now this QRS, as we said before, actually does contain a Q wave, an R wave, and an S wave. So you're gonna make your measurement from the beginning, and so your measurement is gonna start right here. So you're gonna include the dippity doo -dah. you're gonna include the um, Q wave, and then um, where, the, where the R wave is. Um, so include that, and then we go right to the end here. So you're gonna be measuring from here across to here. And so remember, we're looking at baby boxes. Now the QRS should be less than 0.12 seconds. So that's less than three baby boxes. If it's 0.12 or more, then it can be some sort of a block in the ventricles. And you'd actually need a, a 12 lead EKG to figure out where the problem is specifically. The next thing we look at, so we looked at the P wave and we measured a PR interval. We look at the QRS and we measure the QRS from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the QRS. The next thing we look at isn't a waveform and that's this little bit right here and that's called the ST segment. This is the time between ventricular depolarization and repolarization and there should be no measurable electrical activity for this brief period of time that allows the ventricle to con complete contraction. Now, since there's no electrical activity, the ST segment should be isoelectric, meaning it's at baseline. And so remember, if we follow our line, we've, we've determined our baseline, yes, my ST segment is at baseline. If the ST segment is up here, I have an elevated, or I have ST segment elevation. If the ST segment is down here, I have ST segment depression, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and there's many reasons for those two things to occur. One, one thing is, you know, if we think about ST segment elevation, we think about STEMI, a, a, an ST elevation MI. Um, there are other things that can cause ST elevation, but you always have to think what would be the worst thing that was happening and rule that out first. Why would a heart attack or, or sometimes ischemia or electrolyte, electrolyte imbalances cause problems with the ST segment? Well, it's because we need energy in the form of glucose and oxygen to fuel the pumps and restore the electrolytes where they belong, and that gets harder where we don't have fuel. And that happens with ischemia and heart attack. And um, electrolytes can create problems, um, either ST segment elevation or depression, and we know that the sodium, potassium, and calcium are involved in depolarization and repolarization. So that can make some issues, not only with the ST segment, but also the T wave. And the T wave is that last wave we're concerned with. So look at the ST segment only to determine whether it's isoelectric, you don't measure it per se. All right, the last waveform here on a normal EKG is our T wave. This represents ventricular repolarization. The wave should be upright and rounded. Um, it shouldn't be flat, it shouldn't be upside down, and it shouldn't be tall and tenty. We, we're going to make a measurement called the QT interval. 
The QT interval is going to tell us about the time it takes for ventricular depolarization and repolarization. So because we want both of that information, we start our measurement from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. Okay, so the QT interval goes from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. So remember, you know, follow this back down until we're at baseline, and that's your end of your T wave. Normal QT interval is somewhere between 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. Now remember that the big boxes are 0.2 seconds, so two big boxes is 0.4, and that's right in the middle of that, that measurement range. We worry when the QT interval is long, and the reason if it's longer than 0.44 seconds. We worry about that because the back part of the T wave, um, we're not quite, remember this is repolarization, and it's kind of a delicate time in repolarization because we're not quite ready to respond normally. We can respond, but not respond normally. So if some sort of elect, um, ectopic ventricular impulse lands on the back slope of the T wave, the heart can respond, but not the way it should it can cause the patient to go into a dysrhythmia, specifically torsades de pointe. Now, torsades is a form of ventricular tachycardia and potentially lethal. So the actual safe length, the actual QT interval, when I say 0.36 to 0.44 seconds, that's an average um, range. Um, the, the safe range actually varies a little bit depending on heart rate, age, and sex of a patient. So like I say, think of it as an average range. Um, you know, heart rate in particular can change the, what the normal QT interval should be. Um, so sometimes they will correct to that. And so if you see a big Q, a big T, and a little tiny C, that means QT corrected. Now, general rule of thumb, just general, for the QT interval, it should be um, less than half of the R to R interval at normal rates. All you have to remember is this. And that it's bad if it's too long. Remember that, too. Analyzing EKGs isn't hard, but it's something that takes practice. You're, you're pretty quickly going to get to the point where you recognize most rhythms, um, but sometimes you're going to see a really wacky e e EKG, and you work through the analysis, and you come up with one thing, and you hand the strip to somebody else, and that person interprets it differently. Remember, though, what's the golden rule of EKG? Treat the patient, not the rhythm. Here's an algorithm for EKG analysis that we're going to use here and in class. First off, what you want to do is check the rhythm. And by that, I mean look to see if the rhythm is regular or irregular. And you can either do that by measuring the spaces between P waves, um, so P to P, or the QRSs. Um, so we call it R to R, but it's basically QRS to QRS. Um, sometimes if there's a problem, if the rhythm's right, irregular, it's easy to see. Sometimes, though, it's more subtle, and that's where you've got to um, get out a ruler or a calipers, and I'll show you how to do that to, to make that assessment. Next thing we'll do is figure out a rate, the rate, and steps one and step two are interchangeable, um, but you want to do those two things first. Now, if the rate is printed on the strip and there's no artifact or any reason to doubt that that number is there, then you can go with that. If you're in doubt, get a quick estimate with the six-second strip method. Now you're going to start looking at the individual component. So you're going to look for your P waves. You're going to start at the beginning of that EKG complex. Remember the P wave represents atrial depolarization and that those P waves should be upright and rounded. There should be a P wave in front of every QRS and P waves should all look the same throughout the strip. You're going to measure the PR interval. Remember it's from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. Normally it's 0.12 to 0.2 seconds and the PR interval should also be consistent throughout. If that changes throughout the strip, then that's a problem. It's not going to be a sinus rhythm. After we've examined the P wave and measured the PR interval, we're going to take a look at the QRS complex. Now remember that's ventricular depolarization, and the QRSs should look the same throughout the strip again. They shouldn't change in shape or morphology. You're going to do a measurement of the QRS, and that's the beginning of the waveform to the end of the waveform, and it's short. It's only two to three baby boxes, and it's, so it's usually less, it should be less than 0.12 seconds. ST segment, remember, is the time between ventricular depolarization and repolarization when the line should be isoelectric, so it should be along the horizontal line. 
An ST that's elevated above baseline is ST elevation and not normal. Below the baseline is ST segment depression and not normal. You'll have to do more assessment and figure out what the problem is. Last but not least, you're going to measure the QT interval. Remember that that starts from the beginning of the QRS and ends at the end of the T wave. So it includes the QRS, the QRS, the ST segment, and the T wave. Now the QT interval basically should be less than 0.44 seconds. Remember though that's just an average. We get concerned when the QT interval is longer than it should be because it does put the patient at risk for potentially lethal dysrhythmia. going to start talking, we're going to go through specific strips now and put our um, little analysis um, scheme together so we can figure out how to analyze strips. Um, just a little note, most of the strips that I use in, in this packet are from patients that were either on a tele or an ICU, um, and they're going to show you a lot of times two leads or two views. In this one, you see what's called lead two up at top, and the, what's down below is what's called a V lead. Now, if you only look at an EKG from one view, you could miss something significant. We want to be able to, to look at things from different viewpoints. Um, so these are from beat to beat. These are pictures of the same event occurring in the heart, but from different angles, and that's why they look different. Um, for our purposes, when you're measuring and you're trying to analyze, pick the view that's easiest for you to figure out and find the parts and pieces and just stick with that. So whichever you're most comfortable with. Um, and there'll be this one is a is a lead to and a V lead, but some of the others might be different leads. All right, let's apply the algorithm you just learned to figure out what's going on with the strip. I know it's labeled sinus rhythm, so that there's no surprises here. But why? What makes it sinus rhythm? So first order business is the rhythm regular or irregular? Now remember that um, you're going to have to piece that out. So over on the right, I had mentioned calipers. Now don't go racing out and buying calipers um, if you happen to have some. Um, it works really well because you just kind of set the caliper length from one QRS to the other and then you just kind of march it along the strip and make sure that that interval stays consistent throughout. But calipers are lethal weapons. Those pointy ends are sharp. I can't tell you how many times I've stabbed myself with calipers, so you don't need them. Um, you can also use a scrap piece of paper like here or get yourself a full sheet of paper and what they're doing is they're going to take that paper and lay it down and then they're going to mark here, they're going to put a mark here and here on the paper and then you just move the paper along the strip to check the interval between the QRSs. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's pretty easy to do and you can throw the paper away when you're done and it won't stab you. You might get a paper cut but that would be the worst you're going to get. We want the QRSs to be pretty much the same width apart. And in this strip, when you measure here to here, if we were to take, and I can't show you paper on the screen, um, but if we were to look at that interval between each of these QRSs, it's pretty much the same, so we have a regular rhythm. Um, we're going to go ahead and calculate the rate next. So find those grid marks at the bottom of the strip that I talked about. I've got one here and one here and another one here. So from here to here is six seconds. What you're going to do is count complexes. And um, like I say, I, I like to go with the QRSs because they're bigger. And so I'll just start on the bottom one so we can see it a little better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, I have nine complete complexes within six seconds. I multiply that times 10, and I get a heart rate. I'm estimating that the heart rate is around 80 beats a minute. Um, remember that zero to um, six, or excuse me, ha, 60 to 100 is considered a normal rate range. Less than 60 is considered a bradycardia, and um, 100 or greater is considered a tachycardia, just general. After I calculate my rate, the next thing I'm going to do is look for the P waves. And remember, that's the little wave before the QRS. It's easiest to see in the lead two. So this is my P wave. It's that little bump. Remember, the SA node fires off here, and you see that wave of depolarization. Um, and then this is my little part of my PR interval. So I do want to make sure I'm not just going to look at this one P wave and say, yay, um, I'm going to move through the strip and make sure that I have P waves throughout the strip and that they all look about the same. Um, Remember that patients are moving and breathing, and sometimes there's a little bit of artifact that just has something to do with that, so don't, don't worry about that. 
Next thing I'm going to do is measure the PR interval. And so remember, the PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. And so my beginning of P wave is here. So you notice I'm going to stop here, right here, where it lifts off of that little baseline. That's my P wave. And I end my PR measurement right here where the QRS starts. And in this case, I only have an RS. Um, let me see if I can find, this one does kind of line up on a black line, and so it's going to make us a little easier to see since I can't use paper or calipers. Um, I'm lifting off right about here, and I'm covering one, two, three, four, almost five baby boxes. I've got like um, about four and a half baby boxes, so I'm being really picky. Um, so if you get between uh, four to five baby boxes, you're okay. So my PR interval is somewhere between um, 0.16 and 0.20 seconds, and that's within normal range. Um, it, we, we hit right, remember the normal range is 0.12 to 0.20. So far, so good. All right, I already know that the rhythm is regular, the rate is in the 90s, there's a P wave in front of every QRS, and the PR interval is normal. That's enough information for me to know that this is a sinus rhythm. But I'm not done yet, because I need to look for any other problems that might exist. The next thing I'm going to do is look at the QRS complex, and so QRS, QRS. Now down here, um, we've got some biphasic looking QRSs, QRS, QRS, QRS. They all look the same, and I measure the QRS. Um, remember, it's from the beginning of the QRS, and this is a nice crispy one, from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the QRS, which is right here. And when I do that, it covers two baby boxes, maybe a little more, but two baby boxes. And two baby boxes is 0.08 seconds. That's within normal range. The other ratio, ratio refers to the ratio of P waves to QRSs. And on this one, I have one P wave for every QRS. So the ratio is one to one. Next thing I do is I look at the ST segment. Now remember, the ST segment isn't a waveform. It's the time between um, depolarization and repolarization. So this is my depolarization, my QRS, and this is repolarization. And here is my ST segment. Now, notice that if you draw a line um, to estimate um, the, where the baseline is, you see in this upper leads, lead. So if here's my baseline and I start drawing a line, um, I notice in the upper lead, it appears that I have some ST segment depression um, about a millimeter in depth, and so that's about one baby box in depth. Now, when I look at the lead below, I don't see any ST segment at all, but what I do notice below is that the T wave is inverted. But the other thing that's actually abnormal for a V lead is for the QRS to be biphasic. And so there are some problems in our little sinus rhythm. Um, so I do have a little tiny bit of possible ST segment depression. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's really the case. And the reason for that is I noticed that this is also a little bit below baseline. And um, so I'm wondering if something else is, a skewing, is skewing things. So what do I do with this information? Well, assess the patient. Um, you know, look to make sure the leads are placed correctly. Assess the patient first. Um, review labs, review oxygenation. Could be a problem or could be some sort of artifact. Maybe, you know, like I say, the leads aren't in the right spot. Um, last waveform I'm going to look at is the T wave. And um, the T wave here is abnormal in both leads. Um, it's tenty. It's kind of tenty. And remember, it's supposed to be upright and rounded, but this is kind of tenty in the upper lead. And it's upside down. It's inverted in the lower lead. So don't know yet what to make of that. It needs some more investigation. I'm going to measure the QT interval. And remember, that incorporates all of the QRS, the ST segment, and the T wave. So I start my measurement here, and I measure to here, where the T wave comes back to baseline. Um, we cover, when we do this, we cover two big boxes. And so that's um, 0.4 seconds. And that's within normal limits. So we do have a sinus rhythm here, but we do have a few issues that need to be investigated. It's not picture perfect. Now setting, um, sinus rhythm is considered normal, but as you can see, there's some things that, need, that we need to look at, as we mentioned. Remember also, just because you see this on the monitor doesn't mean your patient is stable or even alive. A patient can have this rhythm on the monitor and be dead. 
um, you know, it could be a pulseless electrical activity. So, but no intervention is needed as long as your patient is hemodynamically stable. So remember, you have to assess. Next strip, and once again, it says it's sinus bradycardia, but let's check it out. Um, what makes it sinus bradycardia? So what's the first thing we do? We determine whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. Now, what I want you to do with the rhythm strip starting with this one is that when we get to things that you have to measure or look at, hit pause on the recording and um, figure it out. So for this one, hit pause on the recording and then use your piece of paper to mark it out. And so go QRS to QRS, draw your little, take your paper, mark QRS to the next QRS, and then move the paper down the line and march it out to make sure that it is regular. Take a second to do that. Hit pause. If you don't hit a pause, you're going to hear my next statement, and that is the rhythm is regular. Yes. Okay, next is the rate. And so, once again, I want you to find your six-second strip. And so from here to here is three seconds, here to here. Okay, here's your six seconds worth of strip. Now count the QRS complexes within that six seconds. You should have come up with five, and then we multiply that times 10, and so our, our approximation of rate is 50. So we have a bradycardic rate. We haven't decided to sinus bradycardia yet, but we know we have a bradycardia. What do we do next? We find the P wave. And so um, we have a P wave here, um, P wave, P wave, and remember, don't just look at a P wave and say, yay, I've got P. Um, you never do that. Um, you look to make sure that you have a P wave in front of every QRS and that they look pretty uniform all the way through. Now on the V lead, we do have a little kind of a biphasic sort of P wave, but they do look the same all the way through. Remember, that's representative of atrial depolarization. All right, next thing we're going to do is measure the PR interval. And so I want you to hit pause and measure the PR interval. Remember, you're going to measure from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. So hit pause and do that right now. Hopefully you're back and you have a PR interval of about 0.16. So you measured about four baby boxes. We are within normal range then for PR interval. Next thing we're going to look at is our QRS. And just make sure QRSs um, look the same, and they do. Measure the QRS from the beginning to end, from beginning of the QRS to the end of the QRS. And so here is, I'll start with this one. Here is the beginning of the QRS, okay, right at that point. And here is the end of the QRS. And you see it's pretty short. Hit pause. You should have come up with 0 0.08 or two baby boxes. Once again, that's a normal range. Ratio is one to one because I have one P wave for uh, per QRS. After I after that, I'm looking at the ST segment, and so here's my ST segment. Remember, it's not a waveform, but um, you know it's it's kind of that pause between um, depolarization and repolarization, and it should be at baseline. So here's my ST segment. Now I'm going to find the T waves, and you'll see I've got some inverted T waves. Um, so they're not upright and rounded, so they're not a normal configuration. Um, you also notice in the V lead, you can't even see the T waves. Now, just just as a, a side right here, you know, when you look at something like this, if you're putting this in the chart, it's legal documentation. And so we, we maybe want to take a look and make sure that we can't do something, you know, look to see if leads are placed correctly and things like that so we get a better strip. Um, you know, a little worried about why I can't see certain things. All right, put me on pause again and measure the QT interval. Remember, start your measurement at the beginning of the QRS and end it at the back of the T wave. Beginning of the QRS, back of the T wave. I got a QT measurement of about 0.44 seconds. Um, if you look at the fifth complex, and I think I looked at this one right here. Yeah, the fifth complex, you'll notice that the QRS starts on the dark line here. And so I've got a bigger box that's 0 0.20, and then another bigger box, which is 0.20. 4.04 0 
okay, or 0.4, I'm sorry, and then a baby box beyond that, and that's where I got the um, 0 0.44. Setting. What kinds of things cause cardiac or sinus bradycardia? Well, a well-conditioned heart has enough contractility to move adequate cardiac output without having a very high heart rate. So the resting heart rate in an athlete may be in the 50s, and that's okay. How do I figure out whether 50 is okay? You have to assess the patient. If the patient's hemodynamically stable, then they're fine. So what do I mean by hemodynamically stable? Well, you gotta assess. So what are you gonna look at specifically? Blood pressure, pulse amplitude, skin color, temperature, capillary refill, level of conscious. Um, find out whether your patients have any chest discomfort or shortness of breath. Um, so when you listen to the American Heart Association ACLS videos, if you're going through those algorithms, you're going to notice that the American Heart Association defines unstable as a patient with a blood pressure less than 90 systolic, patient having chest pain, a change in level of consciousness, signs and symptoms of heart failure, or signs and symptoms of shock. Now, other things that can cause bradycardia include sleep. Um, when I worked on night shifts, sometimes we'd see patients' heart rate drop way down, and there was, they were fine. There was nothing wrong with them. It was just part of sleep cycle. Vagal stimulation can cause bradycardia, and so, you know, sometimes we would, the monitor would go ringing, and we'd run in the room, and our patient was vomiting like mad, and so their heart rate was 30 because of vagal stimulation. Um, coughing, severe pain, suctioning, hypothyroidism, increased in cranial pressure, um, conduction system problems, heart attack, and then medications can cause bradycardia. And some examples of medications that slow the rate down that we know are things like beta blockers, digoxin, and calcium channel blockers. Now, once you've assessed the patient, intervention is based on two things. Um, one, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? If they're asymptomatic, then continue to observe, but there really isn't anything you need to do. You know, if they're warm, they're dry, they're mentating, the blood pressure is good, there's no chest pain or shortness of breath, you're going to continue to monitor and, and assess, but you don't try to pick the heart rate up. There's no reason to do that. Now, if they are symptomatic, we're going to follow the ACLS algorithm for symptomatic bradycardia. And that is first thing to administer atropine. Well, first thing is get a 12 lead EKG. Um, but then medwise, we're going to administer atropine. Now, atropine increases conduction through the AV node, so it should increase the heart rate. The dose is 0 0.5 milligrams. That 0 0.5 milligrams IV push can be given every three to five minutes up to three milligrams total. If the atropine doesn't work, if it doesn't increase the heart rate, then the patient may require transcutaneous pacing, and that's pacing the patient through their skin as a temporary measure, or sometimes we use an infusion of either dopamine or norepinephrine to improve perfusion. By the way, that was the ACLS algorithm for bradycardia. Um, we're also going to figure out what's causing the problem and fix that. All right, next strip. Um, this says it's sinus tachycardia, but how do we know? Let's go to the algorithm. Um, I want you to try to figure this out on your own as much as possible. So remember, hit pause as we move through each item so you have time to measure or think about the questions. In fact, if you want to hit pause now and do all those measurements and then come back, that would be good. All right, first off, what do we want to do? Determine whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. Hit pause while you look. If you marched it out, you notice that the rhythm is regular. Next is the rate. So hit pause again and figure that out. Okay, I've got marks here. Here to here is six seconds. I counted 11 complexes in six seconds. I multiplied that by 10, and my estimated rate is 110. So I know I have a tachycardia. I don't know it's sinus yet, but I know I have a tachycardia. Next thing I'm going to do is find P waves. Now, one of the things you may notice while you're looking at this strip is there is a bit of artifact, especially here up front. All of this wiggly stuff is artifact. Patients are moving. Um, the electrodes may not be secured well. I mean, we, we're sticking electrodes on a moving, breathing patient, and sometimes we do get weird bumpiness because of that. Um, I mentioned that because once you find the P waves, you always need to look to see that they look the same throughout the strip. And the first couple of complexes do have some wonky looking P waves, but that's just artifact. All right, 
we found P waves. Okay, P waves, P waves, P waves. We looked through and um, they look pretty much the same. Artifact accounts for some of the weirdness. Measure the PR interval. Hit pause and do that now. Okay, if you measure the PR interval, it looks like we've got between three and a half to four baby boxes. So the PR interval is somewhere between 0 0.14 to 0 0.16 seconds. Um, a little leeway here is okay. Find the QRS complexes, and those are our, our QRS complexes. They don't look spectacularly huge here, but that's, that's what they are. Hit pause and measure the QRS. I measured it at two baby boxes, and so I got 0 0.08 seconds. The ratio is one P wave to one QRS complex. Now we're gonna find the ST segment. Now remember that's between the end of the QRS to the beginning of the T wave. Is it isoelectric? Now, if you look up here on the top, um, it does appear, that's the lead two up here, it does appear that you have about a half of a baby box, a half a millimeter depression, but weirdly you only see that on some of the complexes, not all. If there really is ST segment depression, it's going to be an all, not just a few. So once again, this is kind of wonky artifact. Look at the V lead below. Um, I don't see ST segment depression here. T wave is kind of hard to see on both leads. Um, I usually find the complex that looks the best and go with that to do my measurement. Um, for the most part, it looks like the T, we T wave in lead two is upright and rounded. Um, I want to measure the QT interval, and I'm thinking that this, uh, about the, which one here? This is about the fifth complex from the left. One, two, three, four, five. That one looks pretty clear, and so that's the one I'm going to use to measure. I measure from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. Go ahead and hit pause. Make sure you come back. I measured the QT interval as 0 0.36 seconds, um, so it is within normal range. All right, so we've determined that we have a sinus tachycardia. Um, let's talk about the setting. If you're out running around, um, you're exercising, then tachycardia is happening because your heart's trying to increase cardiac output, so there's an increase in blood flow to your muscles and tissue, and that's expected and normal. If your hospitalized patient who's just kind of laying around in bed is tachycardic, well, there's a problem. You need to assess your patient and figure out what the problem is and fix the problem. Um, fixing the problem should fix tachycardia. So what kinds of problems could occur? Well, tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism for things like hypovolemia or even hypervolemia. Um, so look, I mean, is your patient bleeding? Are they dehydrated? Does the patient have heart failure and too much volume? Um, other causes of tachycardia include pain, um, central nervous system stimulation, um, comp compensation for anemia, um, shock, Fever raises the metabolic rate and increases the heart rate, anxiety, medications. Some of those are meds that we give. So earlier for bradycardia, I had mentioned atropine. Atropine increases conductors to, 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 you know, through the AV node. Aminophilin, which we don't use that often, but it is it's a major stimulant and it increases the heart rate. Um, other stimulants include things like caffeine, nicotine, um, or illicit drugs, um, cocaine or amphetamines, for example. There can also be problems with the patient's central nervous system that cause tachycardia. Once again, tachycardia, you don't cure the tachycardia per se, you find the problem and you fix that and the tachycardia goes away. Or resolves would be a better word. All right, um, this is a little different. Um, premature atrial contractions or PACs. Now this isn't a rhythm. Um, PACs are what's called an ectopy. Um, and that means that there are some different things happening on top of an underlying rhythm. I put these here because PACs are actually a very common ectopy. I would venture to say that all of you have had PACs at one time or another. Let's take a look at the strip. First off, we're going to follow our, our, our algorithm. Um, we're going to determine whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. Now, you see that the rhythm is regular, so here to here and all that. It, the rhythm is regular with two exceptions. Right here we have an early beat, and then we're nice and regular here to here to here, and then we have a repeat of our early beat. We have another early beat, and then we kind of go back to regular. 
So we do have these two, the third and the eighth beat are early compared to everything else. I want you to ignore those right now and just look at the underlying rhythm. That is regular. You're going to calculate the rate exactly as you did before. Find six seconds on the strip. And then what you're going to do, um, I see the grids are out of whack. And so it turns out that from here to here, right below the bead, here to here is six seconds. And so um, if you do that, you can count and you see that you have um, eight complexes. Eight by 10 gives me an approximate rate of 80. I'm still ignoring the early beats. Find the P waves. You'll notice that we do have a P wave in front of every QRS on the normal beats. Just skip the early beats for now. I have a P, wa P, a P wave in front of every QRS and they all look the same. I'm going to measure a PR interval on one of these normal complexes. Hit pause and come back. It looks like the PR interval is um, somewhere around a little over four baby boxes. So somewhere between 0 0.16 and 0 0.20 if that's what you got something that that's fine. Um, QRS complexes all look the same. Hit pause and measure the QRS complex. Uh, I've got um, two to two and a half baby boxes, so somewhere between um, 0 0.08 to 0 0.10, and that's normal. Um, ratio, right now, remember, we're ignoring the two early beats. The ratio on the underlying rhythm is one to one. Um, one P wave to one QRS. Let's find the ST segment. It is right here, and we'll notice that it is isoelectric except for the early beats. So we're going to come back to that because remember we're ignoring early beats right now. So ST segment is isoelectric in the underlying rhythm. Locate our, P, our T waves. They're upright and rounded. Now hit pause and measure the QT interval. QT interval is right at two big boxes, and so that would be a 0 0.40 within normal range. Now, with the information I have, I can say that the underlying rhythm is a sinus rhythm. But let's go back to those early beats. Okay, so here and here. Now, if you look at them, you see there's a bump that should be the P wave, but it doesn't look like the other P waves. It looks weird. Um, you may also notice that the preceding beat, okay, so this is a normal beat, but I don't really see the T wave. I see this funky looking, is it a P wave or is it a T wave? Huh. Well, if you looked at that, what happened, if you guessed that both the P and the T landed on the strip at the same time, you're right. What you have here in front of this um, early beat is a combination of the T wave from the previous beat and the P wave from the early beat. Um, the QRS complex looks the same as the others. Um, and like I said, I do see that I have a little ST segment depression. Um, it's a little over one millimeter, um, a baby box in depth. Why would we see that? Now, I have to tell you, this isn't something that you typically see in somebody that has PACs. I, I saved the strip just because of that. Now remember that causes of ST segment depression include ischemia and electrolyte imbalances. If it was an electrolyte issue, ST segment would continue throughout. Could it be ischemia? Yeah. Um, PACs are early beats, and when you um, you know when you have that early contraction, the ventricle has had less time to fill, and because of that, there was a little drop in cardiac output on those two beats that created a temporary ischemia. All right, um, so setting for PACs, and like I say, you always have to figure out what the underlying rhythm is. So I have sinus rhythm with PACs. Setting for PACs, I mentioned before, is pretty common. It occurs in both healthy and diseased hearts. Um, sometimes we'll see this with CAD, with valve disorders, ditch toxicity. By the way, ditch toxicity can cause any dysrhythmia known to man. Um, Anything that causes um, SNS, sympathetic nervous system stimulation, can um, set us up for PV, PACs, um, and then CO, things like COPD, MI, and, and heart failure. Intervention isn't generally needed for PACs. Um, our focus is figuring out what's causing the problem and fixing that. Sometimes, though, we'll see patients develop PACs and increased frequency of PACs before they go into another dysrhythmia, such as atrial, atrial fibrillation. All right, last slide for preclinical lab is atrial fibrillation. Nice segue right into that. 
Um, and we'll be talking a lot more about management of AFib in class, but with atrial fibrillation, the SA node is no longer in command of the heart. Fibrillation is caused by rapid discharges from many, many irritable foci in the atria that are rapidly attempting to pace all at once. That really doesn't work so well, and the resulting rhythm is erratic and uncoordinated. If you could actually look at the atria, you would see that they're just quivering. We can't actually count the number of discharges that are stimulating the atria, but it can be as many as three or 400 a minute. Now, atrial fibrillation is easy to figure out. There are two hallmarks to AFib. Atrial fibrillation is irregular, the rhythm is irregular, and there are no discernible P waves. So let's take a look at it step by step. Once again, is this rhythm regular? It's not. Um, it's irregular. I mean, you can hit pause and try to mark it out, but you can see that the rhythm is irregular. There's a short period of time where, you know, maybe these three look like they're fairly regular, but you don't, we're not talking about short sections of strip. You have to look at the longer length. So we do have an irregular pattern. Um, and it's not just a matter like the previous thing that we saw where you had some early beats. It's just irregular all over the place. All right, um, we're going to calculate rate. And so we're going to use our six second um, method. And so pause and count. Now, between here and here, between in my six second strip, I count as six complexes. And so the rate is approximately 60. Next step is to look for P waves. And if you go looking for P waves, instead of P waves, what you see is this bumpity lumpity baseline but no actual P waves. Now you may be tempted to look at some of the bumps and say, wait a minute, maybe that's a P wave, maybe that's a P wave. But remember, P waves are consistent. Um, this isn't P waves, this is just that fibrillatory baseline. So, so remember, you know, you, you don't have P's, okay? No P waves, all right, so no P waves. Hmm. Irregular, irregular, no P waves, this is AFib. I mean, but we're not done yet. There's still some things we have to look at. Um, we're going to take a look at the QRS complex, and you notice that the QRS complex, and so I've got a V lead and a lead two here, they look the same throughout the strip. Now, one of the things you have to keep in mind when you're looking at something like atrial fibrillation, um, the atria don't stop quivering. Um, we still have our chaotic electrical storm no matter what, and sometimes that fibrillatory baseline can kind of change the way some of the QRSs look. Um, and that's not that the QRS morphology changed, it's just the um, fibrillatory baseline. Now, I look at the QRS and it looks like I'm covering three baby boxes. So my QRS is, is a, right at 0.12 seconds. Now that's a little bit on the long side. Remember the QRS should be less than 0.12 seconds. Um, it, remember, QRS measures the time it takes for conduction through the ventricle, so maybe there's something slowing things down just a bit. But we have to have a 12 lead EKG to be more specific. No discernible P waves, so no ratio. Now, once again, the T waves are harder to see with AFib, and it's what I had said before, that the atria doesn't stop quivering, even during ventricular repolarization and depolarization. So you can see that that fibrillatory baseline occurs at the same time that QRS and T waves are happening, um, and that distorts the look. However, if I look in, uh, notice that when you look in the lead two, um, P waves are, let's see, lead two, the P waves are inverted now. I'm looking at T waves are inverted. They should be upright. Um, what I want to do is find the cleanest look in P wave and measure the QT interval. Um, let's see. I think that probably this right here would be the cleanest look in, and I would use this to measure my QT interval. So from here to here, um, it's almost but not quite two big boxes, so I'm short by a baby box on here when I look at it, so I come up with a QT of um, 0 0.36 seconds, which is okay. Setting, so I've determined that this is atrial fibrillation. Setting for atrial fibrillation, um, once again, this is a relatively common dysrhythmia. Now, it can be acute or chronic AFib. We'll talk more about this in class, and we'll talk about treatment and management options. As always, assess your patient first. Is your, patient, you know, is your patient hemodynamically stable? If not, you have to fix that. One of the fixes, one of the things we look at first 
is controlling the ventricular response. What do I mean by ventricular response? Remember that the AV node is actually protective of the ventricle in two ways. One, the AV node hangs on to those imp that, an impulse um, for a fraction of a second before it passes along to the ventricles. And um, you know that allows the um, ventricle or the atria to contract, and then and the AV node will also protect the ventricle from excessively high atrial rates. You can survive with atria that are quivering at a very rapid rate, but if that happens in the ventricle, we've got V-fib and you're dead. There's no cardiac output from quivering ventricles, so you hate it when that happens. The AV node prevents that from happening by only allowing some of the ectopic impulses through. But it does so in an irregular pattern, which is why AFib is irregular. So we term this ventricular response, and it really means rate. Um, we've already determined the rate is about 60, and that's actually pretty good for AFib. When atria are just quivering, there's no atrial contraction. Re um, atrial contraction normally happens at the end of diastole. At the beginning of diastole, the AV valves open and blood from the atria rushes into the ventricles due to a pressure gradient. The pressure in the almost empty ventricles is lower than the pressure in the nice full atria, and so volume moves into the ventricle passively because of the pressure gradient. Then we get the atrial contraction at the end of diastole. Atrial contraction adds about 20% to that ventricular volume. With AFib, we don't have atrial contraction. The other word for that is atrial kick. So we have to have plenty of diastolic filling time so those ventricles can fill. That's why rate control is so important. The faster the heart rate, the less time we have for diastolic filling, and that winds up reducing cardiac output. Now, when cardiac output goes down, the body's compensatory response is to increase heart rate. And the problem is that's just going to decrease diastolic filling time even more and make things worse and worse. It becomes like a snowball rolling down a hill. Cardiac output continues to drop. Heart rate continues to go up. Cardiac output drops even more. So we need to keep heart rate down enough to allow adequate ventricular filling. How do we do that? Um, well, first, make sure there isn't an underlying problem that's causing the rate to go up. An example would be dehydration or pain. You know, fix that. Um, we may need medication to slow the rate, and that includes things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Um, amniodrone is an antidysrhythmic, and it may convert atrial fibrillation into a normal rhythm. It can also, or it also slows conduction through the AV node. And so that can help with rate control. If the patient's in a rapid atrial fibrillation and they are unstable, um, then cardioversion, which is electrical therapy to reset the atria, is considered. And like I say, we'll talk more about AFib management in this class. Remember, though, AFib is easy to figure out. A regular rhythm, irregular rhythm, and no discernible P waves. All right, folks, well, you guys have listened to me long enough. That's all of this recording to prep you for the EKG part of the preclinical lab. We're going to continue on with the other um, dysrhythmia in lab, the rest of your packet. And I placed um, a page with some practice strips for you to figure out. You need to bring, you need to do them and bring them to preclinical lab. That um, is going to be your ticket in for the EKG part of lab. Um, please do email me at cummings at gatewayccu.edu if you have any questions. Um, I will. I look forward to seeing you in preclinical lab. Thank, very, thank you very much for all of your attention.